How can I know the will of God for my life? That is one of the more common questions that's asked in churches. After all, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10 urges us to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That involves knowing what the will of God is. Colossians 1.9, a prayer of Paul, actually prays for this, that we'd be filled with the knowledge of God's will in spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we're supposed to grow up in wisdom and understanding, and then we'll know God's will. So we do need to know the will of God. It's a good thing for us. Another question that may be more important than that question, it's certainly foundational to that other question, do you even want to do the will of God if you knew it? Why spend all of the time searching for the will of God that when you find out about it, you don't actually like it and you don't actually want to do it? It sounds too difficult. It sounds that it's going to go in a direction where that's not what you envisioned for your life. And so if we're honest, we have to ask the more foundational question. Do you even really want to, to do the will of God? It's kind of a gut check question. It's a heart question. It's a heart evaluation question, a question that gets to the foundation of who you are. What are you doing each week and each month? Who are you living for? You say you're living for God, but are you really? Are you really living for the will of God? Or are you kind of using God in, you know, you're going to school or you're developing in your career or you have ideas of what what you want to do with your children at home and um, God needs to, God needs to fit into that and hopefully he fits into that. If he does, then you can sing hallelujah and But if he doesn't, then you're not too happy with that. Um, Are you mostly living for yourself? Do you add religion sort of to, uh, to your hopes and to your dreams? Or would you say that your will is surrendered to do the will of God? Could you, when you think about yourself, could you say, I have surrendered my plans for my life. I'm willing to go do whatever God wants me to do. Today we're going to read about a man Um, who was told very specifically what God's will was for him to do, at least at that moment. Um, And at first he balked at it, um, not because he wasn't a follower, because it sounded dangerous and too difficult. But we'll see that he listened very carefully to God and that his heart really did want to do what God wanted him to do, even though it was dangerous. And uh, the fruit of it was amazing. So because he obeyed God, there was incredible fruit. And that's part of what I want us to think about today is that when we bow our will to God's will, even when it seems he doesn't know what he's doing, the fruit of it is amazing. So Acts 9 is the text. We're in, in verses 10 through 19. I'll go ahead and read it. Acts 9, 10 to 19. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up. And go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man named Tarsus named Saul, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. So we learned, this sort of picks up where we were last time, that Saul was on his way to persecute the Christians, And Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks and appeared to him, the glorified Lord Jesus, and um, first rebuked Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he called him to himself. He called him to salvation, and he commissioned him to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. He was not qualified to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. There was nothing really good about him, 
Um, in fact, he was the worst persecutor of the church. You might think he's the last person on earth Jesus would choose to be one of his apostles, but that's exactly what Jesus did. And Jesus has a will. Um, he does what he wants to do. He makes choices where he wants to make. He does have a will, um, just like you have a will and you like to choose how to use your time and what you want to do and what your attitude would be. Jesus has a will, and he chose Saul. He didn't choose other people. Um, he didn't even choose Ananias to be uh, an apostle. He chose Saul. And so we saw that last time. But Saul, uh, because he was so rebellious, he was judicially blinded by God. Can't see, so they had to grab him by the hand, right? Lead him into the city. And uh, little did Saul know how much of his life was about to change. He was beginning to think about it for sure, but he didn't know. Now, here we are in the next portion of God's Word, reading it in context. And Luke continues to unfold the spread of Christianity and uh, what we call the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That's why the book is called The Acts. So we see what the Holy Spirit is doing and what Jesus continues to do through his disciples and through the Holy Spirit. And the Lord is continuing to unfold how his grace begins to work. And rather than talking about a new region that was opening up for the gospel and where new churches were starting, this section is telling us about how Saul whose Roman name was Paul, got started because we're going to, as we continue to read the book of Acts, we're going to see that so much of the rest of the book of Acts and so much of what the Holy Spirit does is around this one man, Saul of Tarsus, Paul. And so we need to know about how things got started with him. Well, we saw how he got saved. Now we're seeing his uh, formal commissioning here and his regaining sight. And so all of this is meant to explain that for us. God is working his will. And um, Saul had a will, and Jesus said, no, I'm not going to allow your will to stand. Um, I'm going to stop you from doing what you want to do. And what I want to have happen, that's what's going to happen. You're going to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And by the way, God had a will for Ananias. Ananias didn't wake up that morning and say, you know, I might get a vision from the Lord today, and I might have to go and lay hands on that guy that's persecuting all the Christians. Now, he didn't know this. He didn't know. He didn't get any warning at all for this. He was going about doing what? We don't know. He was just going about his usual routines, and God interrupted and said, I know you have a will for what you want to do with this day, Ananias, but it's not going to be what you want. It's going to be what I want. Do you already see a conflict of wills going on here, right? So in God's interaction with Ananias, we're learning a lesson about the will of God, and I want us to learn it, that we have to be willing to to do the will of God. We have to be willing to trust God that when He has a will for us, even though we had all these plans for ourselves, it ain't going to be that. It's going to be what God plans for our life. It's going to be what God wants for our life. So God's will often seems difficult. We think, well, wait a minute. If I really give my will to God, then He's going to send me to Togo, Africa, like the Reismans went. And I don't want to do that. That's too much sacrifice. And so you hold back. You don't trust God. You think like... Like there's something that's bad that's going to happen to you if you start getting steered in the will of God. So you've got to hang on to control of your life and you've got to make sure it steers in a certain direction. What you don't know is that you're not in control of your life and you never will be. And that the more you continue to hold back from what God wants you to do, the less of a blessing you're going to be to yourself and to everyone else. Well, see, God knows what he's doing and he's ordering our obedience. He wants us to obey, not to hurt us, but to shape us, to mold us, to change us to make us better than we are, to take us in places we never thought it was possible for us to go. Ah, there you go, doubting, not yourself, but doubting God. So we have four truths to learn about the will of God today. Here's the first one. God's will is God's Word. Oh, boy, that seems so simple, doesn't it? God's will is written in God's Word. Look at verses 10 through 12 again. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord, and verse 11, and the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. There's God's will for Ananias. So we meet this disciple, the disciple named Ananias. A disciple, of course, is just a regular way of identifying a Christian. He's a believer in Jesus. He's someone who is saved. He's following Christ's teachings already. Disciples are supposed to do that, by the way. Disciples are supposed to embrace the will of their master and their teacher, correct? 
Have you ever listened to Chris Tomlin's song that expresses discipleship that way? Remember his song? He says, where you go, what? I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. That's discipleship, right? I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. Who you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will what? Follow you. That's what Ananias was doing. He's a disciple of the Lord. That's what you and I should be doing. The essence of discipleship is giving up your independence, giving up your control of your life, giving up your plans for your life. That's the essence of discipleship. Live a life for the will of Jesus Christ and trust Him. Trust Him with it. Well, Ananias was like that for the most part. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 12, we learn a little more about Ananias, that he was a Jewish believer, that he was a devout man, he had a good reputation, he practiced the law of God, he did the right things. We also learn here he lived at Damascus, and he appears not to be one of those disciples that fled from the persecution in Jerusalem. We say that because later he says, I have heard about this Saul who persecuted some. So he doesn't have firsthand knowledge of the persecution in Jerusalem. He says, I've heard about that. Now, you need to remember that when Luke is telling us about how Christianity spread from Jerusalem, he's telling us about a lot of the crucial steps that happened and the important people, but he's not telling us every single thing that happened. So somehow the gospel has already gone to Damascus. That makes sense. It's been a couple of years. The gospel would spread. It's such a great message. It's gone, and and here is a believer in Damascus, and uh, there's already some believers involved in the synagogue. They don't have their own church building. They're meeting in the synagogue. They're Jews, and they're believers in Jesus. And so he got a report about Saul, and he'd heard about all of that. Now, if we're talking about the name Ananias, and you're getting a little bit confused because you're saying, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I remember this name Ananias, and you would be correct. And that would be all the way back in chapter 5. That was what we call the bad Ananias. (laughs) Bad Ananias was struck dead by the Lord because he pretended to give more than he actually gave in church, and he tried to schmooze everybody, and he tried to say what a wonderful, devout, sacrificial believer he was, but he was keeping back half of the stuff for himself. He lied to the Holy Spirit, who's God, and God struck him dead through Peter. This is the good Ananias, and how do we know he's the good Ananias? Because we look at his actions. We see his obedience, and we say, well, this is the good Ananias. This is the kind of disciple you want to be, but you might not be. And you need to think about this. With a good reputation in the church, people said, now there's somebody who gets working for the Lord and you can count on him and he's ordering his life and his family according to the way God wants and when the church needs him or her, he or she is there and and these are people that are consistently living the Christian life and you don't have to always be counseling them. Everybody needs counsel once in a while but you don't have to always be pulling them, you know, to get them to do something. We had people in the earlier part of our church plant, some of the folks were there towards the beginning, and we had to always be telling them, why aren't you coming to church? Why aren't you coming out to church? Hey, we noticed that you're missing from church. Why aren't you coming to church? Someone has to always be coaxed and encouraged to come to church is not a very good disciple. You got that, right? I mean, sooner or later, you got to take responsibility for the things that are you. And uh, we all miss church once in a while, but if you have to constantly be told, do this and do that, you're not a very good disciple. You're not reliable. Come on. It's just kind of obvious. Well, this was a good disciple. And so here is this guy. He loves the Lord. He's walking in the teachings of Christ, doing the best he can. He desires to do the will of God, but God is going to put him to the test. By the way, at any given time, God can move into your life in some different kind of way and put you to the test. You think? You, do you think? You might be going along and there might be someone that you don't really want to serve, but they're they're right in your pathway. And you're remembering all those sermons and those Bible verses that you memorized and you can't get it out of your head. And the Holy Spirit's kind of talking to you through all of that. Help this guy. But I don't want to help this guy. I want to go and get ice cream with the family. No, go help this guy. That's what you're going to have to do. And the Lord's going to intrude on you and he's going to find out, did you give your life over to him or are you still living for yourself? Are you poised and ready to do the will of God? Just read it in Psalm 40. Did you catch that in the Scripture reading? I delight to do your will, oh my God. Do you know who said that? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ delighted to do the will of God. And even the time where he wasn't sure and it was hard, Father, let this cup pass from me, he said, nevertheless, what? Not what I will, but what you, your will be done, right? Right? 
He taught the disciples, said, I, I want to know how to pray. And he said, here's how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, but my will be done. Is that what he taught them? No. He said, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. Your will, God. Your will, God. It has to be done. What about Psalm 143 and verse 10? Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Have you confessed Christ as your God? Then do his will. Well, next we see the will of God very specifically revealed. God reveals his will to Ananias via this this vision. A vision, a horama, is a supernatural sighting of something that God wants to reveal, kind of behind the scenes, something that's going on in the spiritual realm that's real but can't be seen with the normal eyes. Science doesn't know everything right. The human senses don't discover everything that is real in the universe. And a, a, a vision is not hallucination. You could take drugs and get a hallucination. That's not it. It's not uh, Ananias' heightened imagination. It's not his emotions running wild. A vision is a real supernatural sighting of something that God reveals to that person and to nobody else. What's the purpose of the vision? God's going to communicate truth to the person. Typically, it was the prophets who received dreams and visions, as it says back in Deuteronomy. They were told that they were going to receive dreams and visions to convey the word of God to the people of Israel. Sometimes, and rather rarely, dreams and visions were given to other people as well to communicate God's specific will. This would not be adding to revelation in the Bible. This would not be something where doctrine was being revealed that would be given to the entire church, but someone received in a very rare sense some special guidance from God. And notice how God addresses him in this vision. Ananias, he calls to him. God calls on him. God addresses him and calls on him. Well, God knows your name. You may not hear God speak your name, but you may have a real strong sense that God has some specific things for you to do, and that's God talking to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. God, listen, God is always doing things behind the scenes that we do not know is going on, right? We call that the secret and the sovereign will of God. That will of God is not revealed to us. We don't know what he's doing next. There's a few times that he tells us in the end times there's going to be this man of sin and there's going to be the rebuilding of the temple and there's going to be a rapture and there's going to be a second coming and we hear about some of the big events in God's sovereign plan for the future and we get kind of the inside scoop on that. But the vast majority of things that God is doing and all the myriads of angels are doing right now, what are they doing in India right now? I don't know. What are the angels doing in Pakistan right now? I don't know. Are there any angels in Pakistan? I don't know. You know. All these secret things that are going on behind the scenes, God doesn't have to tell you. God's not going to tell you. And if you act as if he tells you and he lets you on the inside every single morning, you get a vision from God, I feel sorry for you because that is your imagination running wild. But God has a s- secret and a sovereign will and he knows what he's doing and he doesn't usually tell it to us, but once in a while he breaks through and he says something and a person needs to be ready to do it. We are not, by the way, to try to discover what the hidden, sovereign, secret will of God is. Who is it in the future that I'm going to marry? Tough luck, buddy. You're not going to know that right now, you know? What job should I get? You're going to have to use the wisdom of God's word and check your motives and choose the best job that you have. You're not going to get a special voice from God that says, go get this job. You're going to have to figure it out based upon the scripture. All of these things kind of come to a head in Deuteronomy 29, 29. It's a great verse to memorize, and it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, right? Right? He, those are the things that belong to him. They're secret. We call them sovereign and secret. But the things revealed, the things revealed, that's in the Bible, right? The things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. How do I know if I'm doing the will of God? Answer, the will of God is the word of God. But sometimes God makes specific applications of his word known to us. And we know with confidence what we're supposed to do. That's part of what you're even supposed to be doing right now. You're listening to a sermon right now. You are listening, aren't you? And as you're listening to a sermon, as you're listening to any sermon on a Sunday morning, you're to be listening. Lord, speak. Your servant is listening, right? God speaks from his word as it is explained. He's speaking to your heart. If you're just ho-hum and you're, you know, you're working on your little text and all the rest of that, then you're not really opening yourself up to what God might be saying to you. Every single Sunday or every time you open up the scriptures and you begin to read them and you have your quiet times, God may be saying something to you. You're to be listening. Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. Be ready like Ananias. What did he say? Here I am, Lord. God says, Ananias, and he doesn't say, what, who, huh? He says, here I am, Lord. 
Very similar to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 4, the boy prophet Samuel. Remember, the Lord called to Samuel, and Samuel said, here I am. What does that mean? Here I stand ready to what? Do the will of my Lord, right? Here I am. Bid me do what you would want, I will follow. Can that be said of you? God comes knocking. This is what I want you to do with your life. This is the application I want you to begin to put into your life. This is the kind of way I want you to begin serving me. Can that be said of you? Are you able to say, here I am? So many are caught up with discovering the will of God, but God has chosen not to reveal most of his will to you. But what he has revealed, is that important to you? Are you willing to do that? The word of God is the will of God for your life. You can go home and solve lots of mysteries. You've been wondering your whole life long what the will of God is for your life, and you just found out this morning. The word of God is the will of God for your life. Are you fervently loving one another in this church? How do you demonstrate that? Then you're not doing the will of God. You obviously don't want to know the will of God because you're not doing it. Are you judging your brothers, looking down on some of their actions and doing what they do in the news all the time? And that is when they criticize one another, they make each other seem like they are the worst human beings on the planet, right? Are you doing that? Are you always judging other people? Are you you're judging your brothers here? You're breaking the will of God. You're not doing the will of God. You don't want to do the will of God. You, you were already told the will of God. Don't judge your brother, and you, you could care less. You're going to go ahead and judge him anyways. Don't slander him. Don't speak against him. The Bible says that, but you go ahead and do that. Are you aloof from your church? You don't want to be involved in your church? You don't want to do? You don't want to help meet the needs in the church? You don't want to give in the church? You're not doing the will of God. Quit acting like, oh, I want to know what the will of God is. You don't want to know the will of God. You want to do the will of you. You hope the will of God fits into the will of you. Are you making disciples of other people? How long have you been saved? Who are you pouring into? Who are you teaching things about Christ? You're sitting on a fence. Don't you know that teaching others about Christ is the will of God? Are you doing that? Who are you doing that with? When? How often? How many more sermons do you need to hear to do that? Are you memorizing Scripture? Oh, that's too hard. You don't want to do the will of God. Are you witnessing? Come on. The Word of God is the will of God, and the will of God is the Word of God. You know, God could use other means if He wanted to to communicate his will, but he said, no. I took time to write the scriptures. I put the author of the scriptures in your mind and your spirit. You really want to know the wisdom of God so you can make good decisions and you can understand the beauty of doing the will of God. Get busy meditating more and more on the scriptures and follow that. Don't wait around for a dream or a vision. Ananias wasn't waiting around for a vision. It just happened to come to him, you see. How many visions did Ananias get in his entire life? This might have been the only one. That means 99.99% of every decision he had to make was apart from a vision. You got that? You need to be ready to do the word of, will of God by reading the, the word of God. Well, in this case, very specific instructions came to Ananias. Get up and go to the street called Straight. Probably was the Straight Street. That's probably why it was named Straight. The street was Straight, so it's called the Straight Street that was called Straight. There's kind of urgency in these words. This was something that Ananias was to do immediately. He was not to delay. In Damascus, there really was a street called Straight. By the way, that street is still there today, but it's not called Straight. It's called something in Muslim. I'm probably going to butcher the name, but here it goes. Durb el Mastakim. So if that was bad, uh, you can correct me later. It's still there. It's in the old city of Damascus. By the way, another little note of the accuracy of Dr. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, when people say the Bible is not historically accurate, they are wrong. It is very accurate. And here's just another small detail of something that we can analyze and know. Well, the specificity continues. Inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Well, we know nothing about this house. We don't know who this Judas guy was, except to note again that Judas was a common Hebrew name in those days, and that Judas was probably an acquaintance of Saul's, so that when he was led by hand into the city, he had to go somewhere, so he went to this guy's house. Maybe he was a friend. Well, God continues. He's praying, and he's seen a vision. Well, God does 
great things during times of prayer, and it's in this prayer where Saul was submitting himself to, to do the will of God, and he was fasting, you remember, from last time, and he was probably rethinking everything that he had to learn about the law and about Jesus and the temple and Christians and everything. I mean, he's extremely humble to this point, and he's, he's fasting, and he's praying, and he's willing to learn. I would say, again, if, unfortunately, not enough of us spend enough time in serious, prolonged prayer to get our hearts ready to do the will of God. That's what Saul is doing. And Saul got a matching vision to Ananias's, and that way Saul would know who Ananias is, and Ananias would know who Saul is. They got matching or what's sometimes called double visions. So each one would know what the other one was doing, and it would all be set up by God, right? God gave specific instructions to Ananias. He gave specific instructions to Saul. They saw the same thing happening together. They saw a little bit of the future. This is amazing how God all orchestrated all of this. Well, God could have conveyed all of this information to Saul directly himself. After all, he appeared in a vision to him. He could have said, I'm going to tell you now everything with your life. But isn't it interesting that often that God wants to tell other people what what God's will is for their life, and he wants to do it through other people who come to you and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, have you ever considered doing such and such? And you say, no. Why don't you consider that? There's a real need in the church. You know, there's people that are hurting, and you might be the person that God might be tapping on the shoulder to do that. John Calvin got started in his ministry in Geneva by one person being rather obnoxious and not letting him go and saying, you must stay here and you must do your ministry. He saw something in young, young John Calvin that he thought was going to be amazing for the church, and guess what? He was right, and it took another person to communicate the will of God to, to Calvin so that we could all benefit from all of his writings and everything that he did. Well, that might be true of you. I remember, I remember people coming to me all the time and say, hey, Tom, you, you ever thought about being a pastor? And I said, not really. I said, well, you know, you might want to be a pastor. I thought people were just telling me that because they were lazy and not studying the Bible. I was studying the Bible all the time. So they thought, you're studying the Bible and you're talking the Bible. Maybe you should be a pastor. And I was thinking, ah, that's just a cop out because you don't study and read the Bible all the time. But it got me thinking. It was one of the things that got me thinking. What really is God's will for my life? Well, that might be you. You might be find something and see something in someone else and go and talk to them. Anyways, um, Saul didn't get to know everything that he was going to do with his life until Ananias came and delivered it. God used Ananias to deliver the message. And God continued there. He said, he saw you come and lay hands on him to regain his sight. And so Saul was awaiting this man to come with his double vision. Saul got to see what was going to happen. All right, second truth about God's will is that God's will takes faith. God's will is not only God's word, but God's will doing God's will, takes faith. That's in verses 13 and 14, if you look at it. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So what God told Ananias to do was not easy, was it? And Ananias had a little bit of an objection here, right? Now, this doesn't mean that he wasn't ready to do the will of God. It means that he had never been told to do something this dangerous before, and he needed a little reassurance. It does show us that not only was God working in Saul, but God was also working in Ananias' life as well. God was helping Ananias overcome fears. And God was going to work in the entire Christian community and use Ananias as a bridge to bring this very dangerous non-believer into the fold. And so uh, God was working in several spheres. We say God has a secret will and he's working behind the scenes and we don't know what he's doing. And here we get a little glimpse of how he's bringing everything together. But it's only a little glimpse. Fear keeps us from doing the will of God. Right here, Ananias box. Wait a minute, I've heard of this guy. Fear will keep you from doing the will of God. You'll think, that's not something I can do. You'll have fear. It won't be faith, it'll be fear. And because of your fear, you won't trust God, and therefore you won't do the will of God because you're afraid. You're afraid of men. You're afraid of people who think of you. You're afraid of what will be required of you. You're afraid of pain or you're afraid of being ridiculed, and that keeps you from doing the will of God. Well, here he's afraid of the danger. You're a problem. When God says, here, I want you to do such, your problem is bigger than your God. You need, to, you need to do what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, right? Trust in the Lord, what? With half your heart? What does it say? With all your heart. And lean not on what? Your own understanding. That's what you always do is lean on your own understanding. But acknowledge God in all your ways, and he'll direct your paths, it says. When you face a giant of a problem, You need a giant God to deal with your giant problem. 
Well, Ananias expresses his concern. I've heard from many about this man. You know, he has official papers to, to bind those who call on your name. All the saints were talking about Saul. <laughs> Saul was public enemy number one to the churches. He'd be the kind of person, if we were under persecution in America, that we would be announcing his name from the pulpit. Watch out for so-and-so. Watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 4 of his last letter. He says, because he did me much harm, and he's going to do you harm as well. Watch out for that guy. He's an enemy of the church. Name him by name and tell the saints, watch out for him. It's good when we name those that are going to bring persecution against the church. It's good that we name, by, name them by name, right? They have deserved that. If they're going to hurt the church, they deserve that. Everybody knew Saul's name. And so Ananias' reaction just underscores how crazy of a conversion Saul's conversion was. Don't, don't let this Bible story just kind of pass you by. It's like the, the greatest persecutor of the church was being converted to become the greatest apostle of the church. This was mind-blowing to Ananias. How could a person like that possibly be someone that God chooses to use? Well, I notice just as a side note how Ananias talks about the disciples of Jesus. He calls them those who call on the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Who are believers? One way to define believers are those who are calling on the name of the Lord. Why do we call on the name of the Lord? For help. (laughs) For salvation. Have you called on Jesus, save me yet? We call on him in worship because he deserves worship, right? We're people who are continuously calling on the name of the Lord. We pray all week long. We come together to call, and that's what we do in here. We call on the name of the Lord, right? The Lord's Supper, we call on the name of the Lord. That's who believers are. If you're not calling on the name of the Lord, you're not a believer, right? First Corinthians starts that way. He says to the saints, those who call on the Lord in every place. So in this place, Believers are calling on the name of the Lord. Over that other place, believers, what are they doing over there in their church? They're calling on the name of the Lord. If they're not calling on the name of the Lord, they're not believers, right? Some people come to this church and they say, I've been to several churches and I haven't even heard the word Jesus or the word Christ or the word cross once. Well, that's because those are not really Christian churches. I don't know what they are. They're spiritual clubs, but they're not churches. You know, they talk about God generically. Unless you're calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian church at all, right? You should get out of that. It's not a church at all. Well, the disciples call on the name of the Lord, and Ananias name, names them that way, and uh, he names them as believers. He calls them saints in here as well. By the way, just imagine somebody being in the news as gunning down people in churches, and he's gotten away with it, and he has a name. You know, he has some nickname, and he gunned down some people in a black church in the south, and then he gunned down some people in a white church in Indiana, and then he keeps traveling around the country, and he gunned down some people in Arizona. We heard about, you know, shootings, but these are in churches, let's say, and now he's got a name, and everyone says, watch out for them, and then one day, one of you says, hey, I want you to greet brother so-and-so. He's going to be a member of our church now. Isn't that the guy that guns down people in churches? That's the kind of shock Ananias had. You need to understand why he's like, wait, Lord, you could have asked me to do anything, and I was ready, but not that. Boy, God tests our faith, doesn't he? What a surprise to find out God can use someone like this. Well, God's will is hard sometimes. You're right, God's will is hard. God's will is dangerous sometimes. God's will is is difficult sometimes. I'm experiencing that right now. His will for my life is not a bed of roses, I'll tell you that. I'd take a bed of roses right now. Uh, But God's will is always good. He's just better, smarter, has so many more aspects to life and how they all fit together than any of us could know. You've got to let go and you've got to trust God, see what he can do with your life. I love the exhortations in Scripture. Psalm 115, verse 9. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. My life's secure. I could ask this question right now. What can man do to me? I could be ridiculed. I could be laughed at. You could slander my name left and right. It's not going to phase me. It's not going to phase me. 
God's taken me through enough now in my life that I know it really doesn't matter what you say about me or my enemies say about me out there or some former member of this church is going around and gossiping about the leaders of our church or whatever. It doesn't bother me. God has strengthened me through my trials. And when you face death for the life of, for the life of Christ and for doing that, nothing phases you anymore. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just not a big deal anymore. And that's what God does in your life. He develops you. He gets you ready for what you have to endure. God was going to develop Saul. God, you remember when David faced Goliath? Test of faith, right? But you forget about the fact that before he faced Goliath, he faced two other deadly animals. Remember that? The bear and the lion, right? God got him ready. It was God's will for him to run into a bear one day out there in the wilderness defending the sheep, but he killed it. And then he killed, he killed the lion. Imagine going to a lion and killing a lion. I can't imagine that, but I haven't had to face that kind of a thing, you know? God got them ready. God will get you ready too, right? God's bringing smaller difficulties into your life now. You need to pass the test because you're going to have larger obstacles to go over later in life, and you'll pass the test by faith, and then you'll have larger things to overcome, and with each thing, God is going to bless your life, and God is going to bring fruit from your life, and that is something that you will enjoy for all of eternity. He knows what He's doing with your life. When God God calls you to something difficult, be willing to trust Him. Are you willing to do the right thing at work? They continue to ask you to compromise your integrity. When are you going to draw the line and say, no more? I will no longer go with what my boss tells me to do because I can't do that anymore. And you are ready to lose your job for the will of God. When are you really going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and hold to your integrity? When are you going to put your life and your money and your house on the line for Christ? God may want you to do that. Are you willing to put your security on the line for Jesus Christ? Doing the will of God takes faith. Third, the third truth. God's will must be obeyed. God's will must be obeyed. If it's not obeyed, there's no blessing. You can't know the will of God. You have to obey the will of God. You can't sit in Sunday school class and debate the will of God. You have to go out and do the will of God. That's the point of this passage. Look at verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said to him, I know, Ananias, this is a terrible thing for me to ask of you. The Lord doesn't have sympathy for our weaknesses sometimes when we doubt him, right? But the Lord said to him, go. Obey. Do what I'm telling you to do. And he's gracious enough to provide a reason for Ananias, right? He could have just stopped there and said, Ananias, go. Remember Jonah when he tried to run? You remember what I did to him, right? Swallowed him in a fish, spit him up. You don't want to go that route, Ananias. Go, here's the reason, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. I can imagine Ananias, he probably had a beard because Jews have beards, stroking the beard and going, so he's going to have to suffer for your name, huh? I like this. I like this. He's been causing us to suffer. He has to suffer. He's going to bear the name of Jesus. I like the name Jesus. Hmm, okay. I'm going to go. The Lord was gracious enough to give him a reason. Go and go immediately. What a clear response. Uh, You you could paraphrase it this way. Ananias, I don't tell people to do things and then backtrack. I've already figured out how everything's going to work. Go and do what I told you to do. We don't need a second person in here drawing up a plan. I got a plan. You fit my plan. We don't work on the plan together. My plan, not your plan. Same thing he says to you, right? Right? You know, sometimes we get out our plans, you know, we write them out. Here it is, you know, Lord, this is what I would like to have in 2019. I'm going to do such and such, and I'm going to do such and such. I'm going to do such and such. How about, how, how do you like them plans, Lord? And the Lord says, <laughs> he laughs at those plans. I tell you what, just wait. When March comes, I'll tell you what's going to happen. And when June comes, you'll see what's going to happen. And when September gets here, you'll see what's going to happen. It's my will that's going to be done, you see. Like I said, far too many people sit around debating the will of God and debating what it says in the Bible, but they're not willing to say, tell me what I'm supposed to do so I can go do it. Some people want counseling. Nothing wrong with counseling. Praise God, we got a counseling pastor here. Pray for him. He's on vacation, getting a little rest right now. They want counseling. 
but they don't really want counseling. They want someone to commiserate with. They want someone to explain all their troubles to. And they want to say, what should I do? But they don't want to go do it. They don't want to go do what they're supposed to do. They just want to come to counseling. I just want to come to counseling. Well, if you, if you already know the right thing to do, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you practicing it? Why are you showing up to hear the pastor say, well, you know, Bill, you know, John, uh, you, you need to trust God with that problem there. You, you know, you need to stop speaking to your wife that way, right? You already know. You know the will of God, right? Why are you coming to counseling just to waste someone's time? Go do the will of God. Go practice what you're supposed to do. I don't hear any amens yet. You know the right thing to do. How many sermons have you heard? How much Bible reading have you done? How many classes have you, have you been to? Go do the will of God. Quit saying, but in my case, I don't care about your case. God doesn't care about your case. God is big for you. God is available for you. God is ready to bless your life. You have to obey Him. No obedience, no blessing. Wasn't that what he said to Israel? You want blessing? I'll bless you above every nation in the entire world. There'll be no nation like you. I mean, you're going to be the richest nation in the world. You're going to have rain. You're going to have crops. Your armies are going to do great. There's going to be no diseases in your land. You're going to be, all you have to do is obey my word. And they didn't. They didn't obey. Stubborn. So you're going to go out. You're going to disobey. Things aren't going to work out. And then you're going to blame God. And what's he going to say to you? You didn't, you didn't obey. That, that's why things are stuck in a rut with you, because you're not obeying. You're just stuck. Well, I don't know how to overcome my bad habits. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know how to lower yourself, humble yourself, get more accountability. Yes, you do. You, you, I, I need more discipling, but there are plenty of, plenty of people that are here to disciple you, and you don't even show up for that, some of you. You, you already know. Just not doing it. No, it's just not obeying. So you want to build yourself up so much, but you need, you need to speak truthfully about yourself. It's in the difficulties the Lord gives you difficulties, gives you obstacles, gives you things to overcome because he wants you to learn to do it. He's got to keep putting obstacles till you learn to obey, learn to obey, learn to deal with that difficult person, learn to trust God with the financial problems, learn to do the right thing at work, learn to speak to the spouse properly, learn to treat your children correctly. He wants you to learn that he has infinite wisdom, that solving problems his way works. Well, the Lord does provide this reason to Ananias, and it's a beautiful reason. I love when he says, you know, Saul is my chosen instrument. What an amazing statement. My chosen skuos, my chosen vessel. I have, I've prepared Saul as a vessel, like a pot, and he's my chosen one. I chose to use him. I'm going to use him. You know, in your home, you have a lot of pots, and you have a lot of dishes, and you get to choose the one you want to use, right? Right? Unless you go to the cupboard and your wife slaps your hand, you're not allowed to use that one. That's for the guests only, you know. But usually you're allowed to go. You choose what you want to. You know, G Jesus chose a vessel. So I'm going to choose Saul. Why did he choose Saul? Just chose Saul. I know, I know. Why'd you choose Saul? I, I just chose him. I decided I'm going to choose him. Yeah, but why don't you choose someone else? I don't have to answer that question to you. I chose Saul. Saul's going to be my chosen instrument. And um, Ananias, you have a duty to do. Uh, I didn't choose you the way I chose Saul. Uh, you're both chosen for salvation. Isn't that good enough? I got one job for you. I got another job for him. This is what he's going to do. And by the way, his job's going to be tough. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings, before the sons of Israel. You know, Paul said, and he understood, that he was called primarily to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Did you know that? He writes in Romans eleven thirteen, 13, I am an apostle of Gentiles. The 12 were apostles to who? To the nation of Israel, right? They were to bear witness to the nation of Israel. Peter, James, John, Philip, Andrew, Thomas, they were to bear witness to the nation of Israel, and they did. Paul would do that too because salvation is always to the Jew first, so he would arrive in town and he would give the gospel first to the synagogue. But he knew his primary, primary ministry was to the Gentiles. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7, he says the same. Isn't it amazing? God took a man that was so ardently Hebrew and pharisaical and legalistic 
and turned him into the greatest apostle way out there to those unclean Gentiles. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Do you remember when Paul was writing about preaching the gospel? Remember what he said? Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. I am under compulsion. He knew. He got a divine command, not merely from a savior, but from a king who was brightly shining that said, Saul, you will bear my name. Boy, what authority came forth from Jesus. And Saul knew, yes, sir, I'm getting up and I'm going to go preach and it doesn't matter how much I suffer. It didn't say, I've chosen him, and this is for all the prosperity preachers out there. And he didn't say not because I'm going to show him how rich he's going to get being a preacher. Now, I'm going to show him how much fun he's going to have leading the churches. I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Part of being a Christian is sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Paul was going to do that. Before Paul was called as an apostle, way back in Luke chapter 21, the apostles were told this by Jesus, but before these things, they will lay their hands on you, the apostles, and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. That was what was going to happen. That was going to happen to the 12. That's what was going to happen also to Paul. By the way, there's a very strong sub-theme that runs throughout the book of Acts. Hopefully, we'll pick up on this at some point in time, that God was very interested in his apostles, in his witnesses, bearing testimony to kings and governors and rulers and dignitaries. It was very important that those that were in charge of entire regions or the entire empire would hear the name Jesus the King and be called to submit. Remember Psalm 2 that speaks directly to the kings, you kings, therefore, O kings, come and kiss the Son of God, lest he be angry with you and you perish in his way. There's a message that as it goes out to individual believers in all of the countries, it's supposed to go to the presidents and to the prime ministers and to the kings and to whatever they call themselves in their country that are leading them, right? And they are to hear the message of the gospel because the message of the gospel is not just, hey, do you want to be saved? It's, hey, surrender before you're judged. Your kingdom is under the judgment of God, and you need to bow before the king. And kings are given opportunity also to bow before Christ, the king of what? Kings, right? That's part of the message. And Paul, part of what he would do is talk to King Agrippa, and he would probably be brought before Caesar. I believe he bore his testimony. Emperor Caesar in Rome before he was killed. And he gave the name of Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, the King of the Jews, to the emperor in Rome. And he spoke to Festus and Felix and others as well. Very important that the testimony goes out to our rulers. In fact, there's a a ministry capital commission that goes out and does that very thing in Annapolis and does it in Richmond and does it in Harrisburg and does it in our nation's capital. And rather than lobbying for one side or lobbying for the other side, they bring the gospel to all the elected officials and they bring Bibles to elected officials and they witness the name of Jesus Christ to them. It's part of, part of Christ's strategy in winning the world is to win dignitaries and kings and leaders because when they bow the knee to Christ, sometimes entire lands are opened up to the gospel. It's, it's strategic. Well, Paul r- later wrote about the sufferings that he had as an apostle in 2 Corinthians. He itemizes them. He talks about, in chapter 6, verse 5, afflictions, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness, hunger. In chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verses 24 to 27, he recites this, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. This is a tough guy. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Yes, Paul was going to suffer. I know what you're thinking. That there, pastor, is exactly why I don't want to do the will of God because it's hard. 
And that's because you don't trust God with your life. That's because you don't think God can bring something good out of the suffering. God can't allow his grace to abound in your life so that you can face those things and have fellowship with Christ and God use you more. That's what you're really saying. Christian ministry is a blessing. My life has been blessed beyond measure by being able to preach God's word. But it involves suffering because you become a target. Do you want to do the will of God or not? Some people hold back. I don't want to be a leader. It's going to cost me too much. Then you don't want to do the will of God because God might be tapping you on the shoulder. You have to be willing to be inconvenienced. You have to be willing to lose sleep. You have to be willing to have your family interrupted. Be dumped on by other people that didn't do what they were supposed to do at church. If you're not, you're never going to make a good leader. Suffering often is the will of God, and suffering is hard. But God, though he's hard, he's good, and he knows what he's doing. Fourth and last, God's will results in blessing. Look at verses 17 through 19. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's two blessings. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. So Ananias obeyed. He, he departed. He entered the house, notice. He laid his hands on him. He really was a disciple ready to do the will of God. He got over there quickly. It's assumed that uh, he talked to this Judas at the door and he got inside and there was Saul just like he saw in his vision and Saul saw Ananias come in just as Saul saw in his vision. It was all matched up and Ananias laid hands on him just, just like uh, he'd seen in the vision and uh, the laying on of hands was you know, for identification and there wasn't any power in Ananias' hands but it was done for ordination and for, for healing in this case. Um, And then he delivered the message, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road and he sent me to do all this for you. And again, God could have done this directly, but he sent Ananias. And this confirms again that Saul saw more than a light on the Damascus road. He saw the Lord Jesus himself. He appeared to you. Jesus appeared to you. And he sent me to re- for two reasons, to regain your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That second reason, being full of the Holy Spirit, Paul was going to need. Paul was going to need to be full of the Holy Spirit. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, do you know what you're also full of? You're full of power. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, do you know what you're also full of? You're full of love. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you know what else is in your life? A lot of joy and a lot of peace and a lot of patience and a lot of kindness. And did you know that those are rewards in and of themselves in your life? That when you're full of the Holy Spirit and you follow the will of God and you bend your will to him and the Holy Spirit can commend you for how you're living the Christian life, you're filled to overflowing sometimes with joy. Nobody can talk you out of serving the Lord. You see a delay from when Saul came to faith on the road and three days later he receives the Spirit. That's an exceptional delay because Saul was being commissioned to be an apostle. We know that believers, as soon as they believe, receive the Holy Spirit because Romans 8 9 says, if anyone does not have the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't even belong to Christ. And we know from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Every believer has a baptism. Paul's bold witness that we're gonna begin reading about in the next section underscores just how the Holy Spirit so quickly gripped him. Before we saw the joy of the Ethiopian eunuch, we saw the face of Stephen shining like that of an angel, all of that was not because of Stephen, was not because of the Ethiopian eunuch, was not because of Saul, but was the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit to do the will of God. We need to bend our wills in prayer and get ourselves ready to do what God wants so we can be full, not of ourselves, not of our own jealousies, but full of the Holy Spirit, ready, poised to do the will of God, humble before Him. And so... Saul was blessed from Ananias' obedience. Ananias did the will of God, and Saul was blessed. First, Saul was healed of his blindness. It says something like a flaky substance. It says something that was scales. The word literally means a flaky substance. 
It was sometimes used of fish scales or of dragon scales, something there that had flakes on it that just literally fell from his eyes. And now he could see. The, the man who was blind to who Jesus was now really does see who he is. And Saul's outward vision returned to him. And next it says he got up and was baptized. Did you know that baptism, water baptism, is the very first act of obedience for a disciple of Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that if you haven't been baptized, you can't possibly say to God, you're ready to do the will of God because you haven't even obeyed His first commandment to you. His very first commandment to you is, after believe, is believe and be what? Baptized. If you're holding back being baptized, you don't want to do the will of God. Because that's the first step of obedience. You need to get past that. Then we could talk about other areas of obedience. People say they want to serve in church. We say, why do you want to serve in church? Well, because I want to do something for the Lord. Have you been baptized? Well, no, not yet, but there's no but. There's no but. If, if, if you're willing to disregard a commandment of God, we don't want you serving. We say that for the youth. When are the youth allowed to begin serving in church? When are they allowed to begin helping out with worship? Up there? Well, have you been baptized? Have you said, I'm a follower of Jesus? I'm ready to be baptized? If you're not ready to be baptized, you should be like some of the younger kids that are 8, 9, and 10, and they're like, please, I want to be baptized. You should be like that. And we want to evaluate them a little longer usually. But that should be your spirit. I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. He got up. He was baptized immediately. Why? Because baptism is the first act of obedience for a disciple. Behold the importance of baptism. Baptism is the commanded will of God. And then he took food and he was strengthened. The time for fasting and mourning was over. There was a time to fast. Now there was a time to eat and get busy doing the will of God as well. Sometimes people sit and they pray and pray and pray to hear the will of God. Why don't you just get busy doing what you already know is the will of God now? Well, he was ready. You're going to see the guy starts preaching right away and he gets into trouble. He starts suffering in the very next passage. I want you to take a step back and ask yourself, think about how many people would be blessed by your obedience to the will of God. Think about if you could get over your fears and get over your stubbornness and start doing the will of God, how many people would be blessed by that? Do you know how many scriptures were written because Saul came to Christ and Ananias obeyed the will of God? Do you know how many churches were started because Ananias went and obeyed the will of God and Saul was brought into the church and received by the apostles? Do you understand the incredible mega bounty of fruit that was born in the church of Jesus Christ because Ananias got up and did what God said to do even though it was very, very dangerous to do? He had to trust the word of God. He had to have faith to be willing to do the word of God. He had to obey the word of God and he had to see that there would be blessing if he trusted to doing the will of God. Same thing in your life. Same thing in my life. Quit, quit trying to reason your own way. Find the will of God and the word of God. Get busy obeying it. See how God blesses you. Let's pray and then we'll be around the Lord's Supper together. Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you for this time of celebration and we want to be obedient to your will that you told us to partake of this and to partake of it with the whole church gathered and uh, not to to do the Lord's Supper in individual homes, but where the whole church is gathered. And Lord, we want to be obedient to you and do your will. And so we want to fellowship with you at this hour. Bless the preaching of your word in our hearts. Help us to be willing to do your will. Amen.